Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. So it's going to get really cold tonight. We're supposed to have some snow, and we do not do well in snow here in Clatsop County. Uh, we can handle like 12 inches of rain, but just a couple inches of snow, and we're like done. Like people are slipping and sliding and crashing all over the place. Luckily, a lot of people around here have four-wheel drive, so getting around isn't really that bad. But yeah, snow, not so good. Rain, no problem. So anyway, tonight is going to be snow. Had a had a guy um, talk to me yesterday, and he says, "Dude, I love the fact that you have that YouTube channel, and it's doing so well, and everything. And I'm real impressed with with everything that you say. I am completely lost on most of what you're talking about, and it kind of took me back for a second because I thought, you know, when I started this channel, I didn't really have much beyond just like you know the conversations that I typically would have with family members and stuff were not that deep we're not that involved inside of the banking industry and stuff it wasn't until I started this channel that we really started like you know breaking that down and having conversations and you know putting comments out there about the Federal Reserve and their money policy and fiscal policies and you know talking about the bond market and stuff and originally like the whole idea of the channel was to try and bring some like awareness to to the economy. A lot of people are just completely lost on what's going on and I was trying to like say, "Hey, I'm going to break things down in a much easier way for for people to understand." And for for that gentleman to tell me like I really like your channel, but I didn't understand most of what you were saying, just really like made me feel that I am kind of like not doing what I was supposed to be doing with this channel. And so, um, and so I thought I would like talk a little bit about some of the things that I think a lot of people are confused about, especially if you are not aware of how the bond market works and how that interest rate that the Federal Reserve sets is not set in stone to when it comes to the bond market and that those interest rates can move around regardless of what the Fed is doing. Now, the Fed's influence is really a dramatic, um, oh, how do I say it? Um, the Fed's interest rate setting is a dramatic impression of control. And that's it. It just gives people the impression of control. It, it, they have somewhat of a guidance that they can push things around, but they have in no way a 100% control of anything out there when it comes to interest rates and the free market and what's taking place out there. A lot of people will argue that, and that's fine, but the Federal Reserve and all their actions and everything they do is less about the amount that they do and more about the impression that it gives to the markets because it's really about getting people and investors to behave in a certain fashion. That is really what the Federal Reserve's job is now. See, the money that they print and stuff, that was, they used to have this idea that they were going to keep this elastic currency where they would pull money in and out of the system depending on how, like as the economy heated up and there was more demand for dollars out there, they would inject more dollars into the system. And then as the economy slowed down, they would pull it back out. But nowadays, when they go to pull the money back out of the system, it starts crashing it because everything is debt-based. Now, I don't want to get into how complicated that is because if you really don't understand the bond market, then you're not going to understand a lot of what's going on in the economy. So the bond market, when it comes to like the U.S. Treasury, and the bond market, when it comes to the Federal Reserve, these are two very separate entities, okay? One of them is the government and the way that they take out debt, essentially. And the other one is the people who print up money and buy that debt. Okay, when you say or hear or listen to economists talk about government debt, they're talking about bonds. Now, bonds can have a lot of different names depending on what kind of bond it is. And there is a lot of different styles of bonds. Typically, most bonds, when you hear the word bond or U.S. Treasuries, they're talking somewhere around the 10-year. 
The 10-year treasury means that when you buy that bond in 10 years, the bond will pay back its face value plus the interest rate of the coupon. That is very important to understand because it is very different from what the yield is. Originally, when you would buy a, a bond from like the government, there would literally be little coupons along the bottom of the bond that you could tear off and go and cash in. And cashing that in would be dependent on what the interest rate that the bond would pay. When all the coupons have been paid off, the bond would mature and you could cash it in for the face value. So it was loaning money to the government. Now you could have that bond and you could cash those little coupons in, but at one point you could say, you know, I no longer want this bond, I want money. I just don't want, you know, I just no longer want the rest of these interests bearing coupons or the face value, I'd rather have the cash. You can sell that bond. You can sell the duration of it with all the coupons and the face value. You can sell that off. Now, what you sell it for to the next investor may be different from what the yield and the face value will add up to. <clears throat> okay. So just for an example, let's say you have a 10-year bond that has these 10% coupons that are attached to it. You rip off one of the coupons, now it's going to pay off, you know, nine more coupons to it, and it has the face value of it. But the demand for it is very high. So an investor may pay a little bit of a premium where those coupons no longer pay him a 10% because of how much he paid for the bond overall. I mean, it still pays a 10% according to the bond. But what the investor is yielding, what they're getting from it because they paid a premium for the bond has now dropped the yield so that when they tear that coupon off and go and cash it in, even though they're getting the same number that the previous bond owner got, the same amount, because the bond buyer, the new bond buyer, had paid so much for it, the yield has dropped. Now, say somebody, works, it can work in the other way too. Because say, for example, that the demand form has dropped and nobody wants the bonds. Well, now you can pick it up for a cheaper price. And the yield might be 10% or the, the interest coupon right, right, <laughs> rate might be 10%, but the yield on it would go up because what you have paid for it has dropped. And if it gets to the point where people really don't want it, then holding on to these bonds until maturity can actually pay off more of the face value plus all the coupons. Here's the problem. If inflation is greater than what this is going to pay, then by the time you get there, the purchasing power will have been lost. See how all this confusion starts to take place, especially if you're not understanding of how all the bond market works. And like I said, this is a very simple explanation of it, so you can see how complicated these things can really be. So let's think about it again. You got bonds, all kinds of maturities of them. There's a coupon rate. That's the interest rate that the bond pays. You got the face value. That's what you get when the bond matures. And then you have yield. Yield is what the investor gets after the purchasing of the bond. Because the bond prices can fluctuate. So once it's purchased and in the system, I mean, that doesn't change. This bond is going to continue to perform the exact way that it always says it was. It's going to pay this much on, on the face value and it's going to pay this much on the coupon rates. What the investor gets is going to be different on an account of how much they pay for that bond. And the more demand for them, the interest rates drop and the prices go up. When the demand falls, the price of it goes down and the yield goes up. So the demand for these bonds can grow so high that the yield actually goes negative. That the investor who has bought this bond, if they held onto it for maturity, all the coupons paid off plus the face value would not pay off as much as he paid for the entire bond. Why in the world would somebody do that? Why in the world would somebody buy a negative bearing bond or a negative yielding bond? It doesn't make any sense at all because you're going to hold on to it maturity. But what if you're not going to hold on to it till to maturity? You're just anticipating that interest rates are going to drop into the future. And if the yields continue to drop, the prices continue to go up you get to sell that negative bearing bond or negative yielding bond. I'm sorry, not negative bearing, negative yielding bond for a profit. If interest rates move the other way and start going up, nobody's going to want to buy that thing at all. That's the reason why the people out there are convinced that they will, that the federal reserve will not allow interest rates to rise. 
can the Federal Reserve keep the interest rates from rising? How are they doing that? Well, they established something called the Fed Funds Rate. The Fed's fund rate is the interest rate that the Federal Reserve has established for interbank lending. Okay, this is very complicated to understand, but basically how it goes down is the Federal Reserve has put a target on the wall. They say, hey guys, we're shooting between this number and this number for the interest rates at the banking level. Right now, it happens to be at zero, zero to 0.25. Now, what that means is, is that when the banks, when they lend to each other on an overnight basis, they have to have enough cash on hand to lend to the people who are in need of reserves. So at the end of the day, some banks have reserves and some are in need of reserves. The banks who have reserves lend it to the ones who are in need of reserves. That lending on an overnight basis is the interest on the, was it uh, the overnight lending rate is what they refer to that as. Now what happened was is that back during the repo market of, uh, what was it, September of 2019? Is that right? Yeah. Gosh, seems so long ago now. Anyway, in September of 2019, what happened was is that all these big banks out there ran out of what they refer to as liquidity. Okay, now liquidity literally means cash. Not anything else. Dollars. Banks can hold a couple of things on their assets or on their balance sheet as far as their as far as their deposits, treasuries and dollars. Treasuries are almost as good as dollars. They can be considered dollars as far as like, you know, doing transferring of funds. A lot of banks would rather hold treasuries because at least they pay a little bit of an interest rate where dollars don't pay any interest rate. Here's the problem. If a bank has too many treasuries and not enough cash, that's the liquidity. The cash is like basically what is the collateral in order to establish loans. Does that kind of make sense? You got treasuries, which kind of is like cash. I mean, it's liquid. And that means that you can sell it very quickly into the market. But the problem is, is that if there's not enough people in out there who are willing to trade those treasuries over for cash, because there's not enough cash in the system, then the whole system begins to break down as the cash is what's needed to create the collateral for the banking system. Very difficult to wrap your head around that stuff. The big banks out there had a lot of treasuries back in September of 2019, right as a big tax payment was coming due from the corporations. That was cash leaving the, corp leaving the corporate bank accounts at these big banks and moving over to the general treasury account or the treasur treasury general account over at the treasury. So all this cash left the banking system, leaving them like, hey guys, we don't have enough cash to do this overnight lending t for establishing, you know, business for the next day essentially there was going to be some people who were in need of reserves and wouldn't be able to operate the next op the next day that's when the federal reserve says oh no oh no 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 we have plenty of cash over here at the federal reserve and we are going to take those treasuries we are going to take those from your bank give you cash and tomorrow you're going to give us back the cash and we're going to keep doing this over every day and we are going to establish the cash that you need directly from the Federal Reserve using this uh, repo facility. But it wasn't the Federal Reserve. It was actually the Treasury who was doing it. But it's the, you know, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, well, it's it's not the Treasury doing it. It's the Federal Reserve with their, with their operations. But it's the Treasury who has issued out all those, all that debt during the time, filling the banking system up with Treasuries. And that was the reason why there wasn't enough cash at the time when that tax payment came due. That's the overall, like, I don't know what to say, the, the narrative that they put out, put out during that time. So how is that important today? Well, if you can think about all these bonds that are out there, you got like government bonds, like the ones that I've been talking about. Then you got like corporate bonds, the ones that the corporations are issuing. This is how they take out debt. So they have kind of the same thing. They're going to sell bonds out there. They're going to have a face value with the coupon rate and all that other stuff. And they will also fluctuate on the market. So as the demand for these bonds increases, the yield drops and the prices go up. These corporations get to sell these bonds as the demand goes up for a premium. You see, so their debt that they're paying back is less because they're borrowing, they're selling bonds for more than what they were worth. Is I guess that would be the easiest way to explain it. And that's how corporate bonds went negative too, is that the demand for them went so far up 
that they actually, the yield on them from the maturity and the coupon would not pay the investor back as much as they, they were, that they were buying them for. It's crazy to think. I mean, it's literally crazy to think that this is possible. So hopefully this is kind of getting, getting you guys like the idea of what's going on with the bond market, because a lot of people look at that yield thinking that's what the bond is paying, which it is after the investor has bought it, but it's not what the bond's coupon rate is. And it's not what the face value is or the face, you know, what it's going to pay for face value when it matures. So let's talk about the impact of what's going on right now, because everybody has anticipated up until just recently, everybody was anticipating that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying up massive amounts of these U.S. Treasuries because they say they are. They say they're going to be buying $80 billion worth every single month. That's a lot of Treasuries. And so when you think about it, when you have a market out there and they don't buy it straight, straight from the treasury, they buy it from the secondary market. They buy it from those big banks out there. So the Federal Reserve is in much in the free market competition as all the rest of the investors out there. The only difference is that the Federal Reserve has a printing press and they can buy as much as they want with very little energy. So this is bringing a demand for these, for these treasuries that normally wouldn't be there. Okay, you see what's happened there? So as they have this demand for it, the prices go up. Right? If the demand was down, the prices come down. So as the demand goes up, the yield drops. This is giving the government a really great opportunity to borrow at really low yields, at the low interest rates. They're able to sell those bonds into the market for a premium. So now the Federal Reserve with their attempt to keep the yield on those treasuries low has got the market believing that the Federal Reserve is definitely going to be participating in this. So they know that there is a buyer for the treasuries. It's the Federal Reserve. So the market now can jump out there and buy up a bunch of these treasuries attempting to front run the Fed. See, think about it when it happened with corporations. The Federal Reserve, there was all this news out there that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying into corporate debt. They, it, was like, it was like huge conspiracy news. The Federal Reserve established, with the Treasury established a lending facility, funded that lending facility with hundreds of billions of dollars. That lending facility bought some ETFs, bought some corporate debt, convinced the market that they were going to be doing this, the whole market tried to front run that idea and provided all the funding to the corporations that they needed. Look at junk. There's a there's a ticker out there, JNK. It's a junk bond ETF. Look at for the last six months. I mean, it has been just rising like crazy. Why? Because people are desperate for some sort of yield and they find it in those high risk yielding junk bonds. See, you go to the U.S. government, you go to the 10 year treasury and it was paying six months ago, it was paying a half a percent. A half a percent interest. By the time you get your money back in 10 years, the purchasing power of, your, of that cash will have, would have been dissolved. It, it would have gone away considering that you have tied it up for 10 years inside of a U.S. Treasury and only getting a half percent interest. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you buy it? Because you know that interest rates are going to drop into the future and that you'd be able to sell that Treasury for a profit. But six months ago, it was a half percent. And today, it's over 1%. The 10-year treasury is yielding 1% interest. And yet, the junk bonds continue to rise. So now, it doesn't make any sense because, you know, you think about it. The 10-year treasury is rising, and this is like the benchmark of all interest rates. And if the 10-year treasury is rising, then you would think that all interest rates would be rising. But it's not. The junk bonds are rising as far as price goes. The yield is dropping. Why? Why would that be? Look at the other durations. Look at the other maturities of the treasuries. Look at the short term. It was dropping. Look at the longer term. It's rising. You know what's happening there? Is people are getting fearful of inflation. See, this is what happens if you follow the curve, the yield curve. See, the yield curve represents the short term. Like if you think about it, you got the short term maturity of like, say, a month. 
and it pays a little interest rate. The farther you go out on the maturity, the higher the interest rate should be. Just like buying a house or a car or anything else. If you take out a five-year loan, you're going to pay you know, a better interest rate than if you take out an eight-year loan on your car. Or even better yet, if you only take out a one-year loan on your car, you're going to even get a better interest rate. And now with interest rates so low, I don't even know if they have interest rates on cars anymore. It just seems like you know everybody's just giving cars away now as far as you know, zero down, zero interest rates. It, it, there's like... There's no curve to the yield. It almost goes completely flat across the board up until just recently. So now, just like buying a house, typically you would pay a higher interest rate for taking out a longer you know, uh, loan, a longer term loan. Same thing with the U.S. Treasuries. As you go out 30 years, you should expect to see a higher interest rate. And now you're seeing a higher interest rate on the long end and a shorter or lower interest rate on the short end. There's like this separation happening. People are scared of putting their money from 10 years on. They're scared of that because they know that the inflation is going to be coming. The Federal Reserve has been putting out that narrative for a while now, saying that they're going to let it run extra hot for extra long. And when that happens, the investors say, I'm not going to tie my money up there. It doesn't pay enough interest. I don't want to lose my purchasing power in 10 years by having my money tied up inside of these treasuries that are only paying 1%. Because interest, you know, inflation is going to be, is going to eat up my purchasing power by the time I get it back. So they're getting out of those treasuries. But they got to go somewhere. I mean, they don't want to just sit there and hold cash. They want to get some sort of return. And they're finding that the short term is still, the yields are still dropping, which means the prices are going up. So they're jumping into the short term don't have to tie up your money as long. And if inflation does come, at least you get your cash back, you can move into something else. But it's not tied up in that long duration. But why is the corporate debt? Why is that going up? Why is the high yield in corporate debt, the yields are still dropping, the prices are still going up? Why are people getting into the junk? Because they have no place else to go. They have no place else to go. They want to get a return and they're willing, they're, they are willing to take on that risk. And that's what's, that's what's scary is that I don't know if they're quite perceiving what risk they're taking on here because they're entering into like basically a one-way street. It is going to be very difficult to get out of a high-yielding corporate debt once the interest rates start to rise. When the yields start to start to go up and the prices start to drop on those junk bonds, there's going to be nobody who wants them. They're, they're high risk. And that's what would be taking place is that if you're going into high risk, you're going to want a bigger return. And because everybody has gotten into these high risk yielding debts, the price has gone way up and the yield's gone way down. The risk has gotten even greater. This is a very scary scenario. Now, if that 10 year which is the safest, most reliable, guaranteed to pay debt in the entire world because it comes from the United States government, if that rises to a point that it now pays better than all the high-yielding corporate d junk out there, well, then people are going to get out of that and go into the safe haven. When that takes place, you are going to find corporations in a very scary spot. A lot of corporations are zombies, which means that they would not exist if it wasn't for the fact that they're able to borrow at incredibly low interest rates. And that's what's taking place right now. They are borrowing at incredibly low interest rates because people are fearful of putting their money in the 10-year treasury, which doesn't pay enough to beat inflation, so they're seeking it out in higher risk, higher yielding debt. And that's where they're finding it. So as this fear of inflation continues to rise, the demand for those junk bonds are probably going to continue to rise as well, which is kind of like putting yourself in even bigger risk during a time when you should not be taking on risk. But that's what's happening. Now, I can only assume that at some point the Federal Reserve will start to feel or see the pain of these rising interest rates.
when they start seeing the corporations start to fall. And a great place to go look is over in China because that's exactly what has been taking place from the last year and going into this year is that they have been trying to take some of that liquidity out of the market because of the irrational exuberance that's been taking place. The irrational exuberance is when people are willing to take on debt and put it towards a malinvestment, meaning that this whatever it is that they are taking out the debt on and putting it towards, there is no way that that thing is going to pay them back all the principal plus the interest payments that they have made. It's a malinvestment. It's not going to work. Now, it can work for a little while. They get it established and they can continue to borrow money to keep the thing going. But at some point, it, when the interest rates begin to rise, when the slowdowns takes place, they are exposed. They are no longer able to borrow the money or the, the payment of the debt becomes too burdensome for them to handle. But as long as the interest rates are staying low and the demand for those junk bonds continue to, to rise as people are fearful of inflation, then the zombies get to continue to feed. Now, when this happens, when this interest rate does rise, and like I said, it's going to be difficult to understand whether or not the Federal Reserve is going to allow it. Like I said, the, the Chinese government is allowing it in a sense. I mean, there's, you know, debt defaults taking place all over, the, you know, over there. And there is plenty of talk of them trying to strengthen up or pull that, pull that liquidity out of the market because of that irrational exuberance. But when that happens here in the United States, if the Federal Reserve allows some of that pain to happen, where the interest rates begin to rise, where they say, hey, you know, we're not going to jump in and, and buy the corporate debt. In fact, we're not going to even, you know, continue on with some of this QE. If they were to put that perception out there, then all of a sudden people are not going to be as um, willing to go into the risk. They're going to see it. They're going to be fearful. And they're going to want to start getting into cash. Because if they do see a crash coming or a downturn coming, they'll be able to pick up assets for a lot better price. So that's when the whole thing begins to unwind itself. As people start getting fearful, it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy. It's just like, oh my gosh, there's a crash coming. Get your money out now, which causes the crash. The Federal Reserve can keep these lending facilities. They've already fired them up once before. There's no reason why they can't fire them up again. I feel that they are probably not going to get in to that corporate debt borrowing. It was all a credible threat. It worked really well at the time. But I think probably what's going to be a much more effective tool is for the Federal Reserve to use yield curve control. So on again, when we think about that yield curve where you have the short-term duration at a low interest rate going out to long-term at a higher interest rate, they'll pick a spot inside that yield curve like say around the three year or something. And they'll say, if yield on that goes over a certain amount, we will buy as many of those three year treasuries as it takes in order to bring the prices of it up and the yield of it down to that particular level. That's what the Federal Reserve would say. We will print up and buy as many three year treasuries as it takes, as many as it takes, until we can get the yield down to that particular level and the price of the bond up to that higher level. And that would be yield curve control. The idea of it is, is that if you can pick a spot there, then you can manipulate and change the rest of the yield curve on it or the rest of the yields on the, on the yield curve. All of that is credible threats in itself. And a credible threat meaning that they say that they're going to do it. They probably will attempt to do some of it if it does actually go beyond what they say that they're putting their cap on, then they will buy it. But for the most part, the market is going to perceive them as being the buyer of a three-year treasury, and they're going to attempt to front-run them before the Federal Reserve has a chance to do it. And so the market should take care of the problem for them if they implement this yield curve control. The Fed doesn't really want to do anything. They want the market to do it for them. And so what they'll say is like, hey, we are going to be messing with that three-year treasury, and we're going to be a buyer of it, and the whole market's going to go like, ha-ha, not before we are. And the yields will drop and the prices will go up as the demand rises. That's probably what the next step from the Federal Reserve will be. I'm just assuming that. I don't know. Now, they did do some of this back, you know, back in the day after World War II. 
they tried to, you know, well, actually, they didn't try to. They did implement a yield curve control, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, they did participate. The Federal Reserve did participate in printing up money and buying some of those treasuries during that, during that time. But for the most part, the market took care of business for them. So I know this stuff is, like, really complicated. I know it's kind of tough to wrap your head around. But these things need to be looked at. You need to understand what's happening here. Now, if the Federal Reserve doesn't, let's say, for example, that they do let those interest rates rise. They do let the market determine where the interest rates should be somewhat. Because if they just let it go on its own, it would be interest rates would be off the charts. No, the whole system would crash. So there's no way that they're going to allow interest rates to go find their own free market level. It's not going to happen. But they may let some of the free market work on its own. And what I mean by that is like if you look over at China where they start pulling some of that liquidity out where it says, hey, there's liquidity out there somewhere. And when I say liquidity, I mean cash. I mean, there is people out there who have the cash who are willing to lend that into the system. They have it in their bank accounts. They have it tied up in another asset. They have it somewhere that they can either get it and move it towards, you know, a particular direction. And that's the liquidity. That's the cash in the system. And when you have a lot of that cash in the system, it really starts inflating a lot of asset prices. It starts going into the housing market. It starts going into real estate. It starts going into, you know, different places. It goes into the bond market. And these things start to swell in price. And when you start to recognize it's like, oh my gosh, there's the irrational exuberance. There's the swelling of the pricing. There's the inflation or the hyperinflation that's going to start taking place. If we don't do something about it, then you need to reverse course. You need to start tightening up that liquidity. Start pulling that cash back out of the system. See, it's not like before where they were an elastic thing where it was just like, hey, we're going to put a bunch of money in the system when things are, you know, when things are running really hot to make sure there's plenty of cash and we'll pull it back out when things slow down. That's... That's not what they do now. They throw a bunch of cash in the system when things go bad in hopes that it will fire things up and get things going again. It's not, it's not an elastic money supply like it would, like, you know, they, they had sold it off to be. Now, let's say, let's, let's go back to what the Federal Reserve, if they do let those interest rates rise. Corporations will be starting to eat themselves. Essentially, they will have no other choice but to try and come up with the money that they need to pay those bonds or else suffer a default. And if you default, that's going to be a really bad news. So we don't want to go into default, right? The corporations don't. If you're, if you're a corporation, you don't want to default on your loan. You want to make sure you want to pay it off, but you don't have any cash and you can't borrow it any cheaper, right? The interest rates are rising, so that means you would have to pay a higher interest rate to roll your debt over. So that means you need to pay it off. If you can't borrow more money to, to pay off the old loan, then you got to pay it off. How do you pay it off? Well, if you're not a profitable company, what are you going to do? Well, you could start downsizing, laying off employees and, you know, selling off your assets and stuff like that to try and pay those bonds. Or all that stock that you've been buying back over the years... You can start selling that off. Just pay your bondholders. So you think about that. Interest rates are rising. Bond prices are dropping. And they have to start selling their stocks, which is going to start causing the stock market to drop. The Federal Reserve cannot allow that to happen. That's the narrative. They will not allow that to happen. I'm not saying that. That's what everybody else is saying out there. I don't know if they have a choice. See, if the market out there all of a sudden says, you know what, I don't care what you do, Federal Reserve, I'm getting into cash, or I'm getting into gold, or I'm getting into Bitcoin, but I am not following your lead and in buying into that corporate debt, or buying into those three-year treasuries, or buying into anything that you're saying, because I don't trust you. That's when the system will fail. But people don't think that way at all. They see the Federal Reserve, they see what they're going to do, and they try to follow their lead. Don't fight the Fed. That's the common common statement out there. Is that if the Federal Reserve is going to be getting into quantitative easing, then that means you should be getting into the Treasuries before they have a chance to. That's what they say. I don't say that. 
That's the narrative out there. Now I think about what's going to be happening here in the future. Because there's this stimulus package that they're talking about. Even more debt. Even more debt added on to all the insurmountable debt that the government already has. And this is somehow going to start fixing the system. Like all the previous statements of stimulus said that they were going to do. It's got to, it's going to come apparent to people at some point that they're not working, right? It's not working. It's failing miserably. It's because it's at the end of a debt-based currency. You can only drop interest rates so low before they go negative. And once it goes negative, it's intuitively, think about it, it's intuitively incorrect. Are you going to loan your money for a long term knowing that you're going to get back less of it than what you've lent out? Does that make any kind of sense to anybody? But that's what's going to happen if we continue on down this road. And somehow it's going to function for a while. But when money itself has a negative interest to it, why would you even hold it? Why would you even attempt to hold it? Why would you want to have an asset that is guaranteed to pay you in a currency that has a negativity to it? Is that what you want? I mean, do you really want to hold a bond that says we're guaranteed to pay you in cash? Good luck with that cash. Or... We guarantee you that this stock is going to rise and pay a dividend in cash. Not that the cash will do you any good. See, that at that point, that's when people are going to switch. That's when people are going to get into Bitcoin or another currency or something out there. And the Federal Reserve right now, and along with all the rest of the central bankers and IMF and everybody else out there, is desperately trying to figure out how they're going to get the digital currency working before that negative interest happens because if they don't do the negative interest the whole system collapses and the only thing that will be left are the viable companies that were not malinvestments and that's like not too many everybody is basically dependent on taking out ever increasing amounts of cheaper debt if the interest rates on home loans were at, goes up the price of the real estate will drop. If the price of real estate drops, people's wealth that they have all tied up in there will begin to drop. And when they start seeing that drop happen, they will do anything they can to secure their wealth and they'll get into cash as fast as possible and they will dump that real estate. Interest rates on real estate cannot rise. The Federal Reserve cannot allow it. They buy mortgage-backed securities. Mortgage-backed securities are bonds backed by the real estate market. So when a house is sold and you sign the bottom line on that mortgage, that mortgage is packaged up with a bunch of other mortgages. And those packages of mortgages are securities called mortgage-backed securities, MBSs. And the Federal Reserve buys $40 billion of those every single month. Think about what if the Federal Reserve was not there in that market buying those mortgage-backed securities. All the investors out there who buy mortgage-backed securities would say, holy moly, we do not have a Federal Reserve who is a guaranteed buyer of these mortgage-backed securities. It's going to have to find its own free market level amongst the investors out there who are willing to buy mortgage-backed securities without the Federal Reserve guaranteeing that they will. That would send interest rates through the roof. People would not be so willing to buy those things knowing that the Federal Reserve was not there to do it. That would be a scary scenario. The Federal Reserve cannot allow interest rates to rise. Okay. It'll get to a point where the Federal Reserve will not have any other choice. They are dependent on making sure that the market knows that they will, that the Federal Reserve will participate. If the Federal Reserve loses that, that whole belief, it's over. Now, the other thing that goes with it is, is that most, most individuals have no idea about any of this. They have no idea how a dollar is, comes into existence. 
They don't understand how it's a liability of the Federal Reserve. They don't understand anything about our currency system. They don't understand how gold has very little to do with our monetary, monetary system nowadays. Gold used to be the standard. It was what our currency was based from. Now it's based in all on debt. It's all based on the promise to pay. And once that promise is broken or not in belief any longer, it's over. The whole system is over. So it's imperative. It's imperative for the Federal Reserve to keep the low interest rates, to keep that debt-based currency going, and to keep the belief that they will be there for it. Now, I know there was a lot said in this video, and I know it's really complicated topic. There is going to be a lot of comments down there in the comment section. If you have questions about particular statements I made, any particular words that are used that you don't quite understand how they're being used, let's talk about those things. Let's break it all down right now so that if there's any questions about what's going on in the bond market that you're not understanding, let's figure it out right now because there is going to be some major issues coming up in this market. Some major issues. And I would hate for people to not understand, at least have a, a basic idea of what's going to be happening here. And I would hope that this video kind of, you know, gives you at least the base idea for somebody who has no clue about the bond market or anything that's going on right now. Hopefully this video will give you just enough information that when you're listening to the news out there, you would understand what's happening because there's going to be some major stuff going down. At least in my opinion, $1.9 trillion stimulus package. You know, I mean, it's even hard to even imagine It's hard to imagine, like, anybody who thinks one day, gosh, it's going to feel good to be out of debt. Like, it, it, and from, like, a government's point of view, there is no way that you're going to get yourself out of debt. There's no way. It's not even possible at this point. So it's a matter of how fast and how far into debt you're going to go into the future. How How long can you keep the promise that you're going to pay going. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.